to refresh our memory from where we left off yesterday. We this is our second visit to the Shenzhen series. The first visit was for uh, well, let's say was largely methodological, but for our current purposes, was reconstructing simplex initials. And now we're working on constant clusters. And then yesterday we got through the S's, and today we will do the constant clusters. Uh, other than X. And so here's the kind of table content, right? So we have X, P, K, P, and then uh, in a slightly different treatment, uh, stop plus resonance, and then nasal for uvulars and resonance. Okay, so now I will just flip through the slides uh, that we did yesterday to remind you, you know, of all the exciting S clusters that we worked at. Okay, so. Resonance with uvulars. Uh, so, yeah, and then you know, I've organized it by the reflex in middle trait or the, the outcome in middle trait, right? So, so, and then shra and sha. Okay. And we get to the more strange ones. Okay, so now where we left off. Uh, Let's say Shishan connections that uh, suggest that we could, should reconstruct uh, clusters with the nuclear key. I think I might close the door. So here we have a uh, K initial and then a P initial. And you know, you might be tempted to reconstruct the Lego healer or something. Uh, but uh, why not say PK cluster? So there you go. We actually reconstruct linear vehicles for other reasons. Uh, and then here is a K, uh, uh, PQ cluster where we have uh, a HA uh, in the same series with a P. Yeah, and so this is about this is about as strange as a Cheshire series can get, right? Uh, so. Yeah, so that's why we reconstruct this cluster here. Uh, and then P before Shra. So uh, remember that uh, TH can go back to a Shra. We can go back to other things as well. Um, so then we, uh, we reconstruct here a Shra. Now you say like, okay, but you know, uh, there's lots of other things that this, uh, you know, you, you could you can take this just back to a, 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 a THR or something and then make PTHR, yeah? Well, that's where uh, other arguments probably come in about uh, morphology or etymology. Yeah. So this is, this is what bad groups are arguing in this case. And that was it for the P's. So as you see, we went on and on and on about S clusters and just maybe three, four examples of uh, P clusters. So now we move on to the, to the K clusters. The K initial clusters. Okay, so here we have, uh, well, if we just look at these two, right? At least it's usually, at least in my own mind, helpful to sort of build up a Sheshun series from the simpler cases to the, to the more complicated cases. So in this case, Maybe identify that, it's a, that we have a D, and then we say, okay, well, either we're in a dental series or we're in a lateral series, uh, and then we see the Y. So now we know we're in a lateral series. So then we know that the D and the Y can go back to a simple L, uh, and then we see that we have this T up here, uh, and then we say, okay, well, T as we've seen, it can go back to T, it can go back to Shra. Uh, but because it's in an L series, then it has to go back to Shla. Uh, and then we get to this A, and we have no way of explaining it so far. We don't expect a K in a lateral series, uh, but why not then just reconstruct Kla? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, here is a. What was that? Well, no one's there. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
So, uh, I mean, you probably, this is a nice one, you all know these oh, characters, right? Lao and Kao. Lao and Kao, yeah. And they uh, look really similar. How to explain it? Well, uh, well, L basically always goes back to R. Um, so then what do we do about this? K, well, uh, A, R, right? But why not just KR? Because we saw here that KR, no, oops, that's KL. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, uh, they need the, I think they need the R to be uh, voiceless in order to get the aspiration. I think that's what they're thinking is there. Uh, right. So that, and then this, is the case that was uh, someone asked about uh, yesterday. So this is how they construct it. Uh, we have a glottal stop and then a K having contacts. And what you should, like if I gave you on your homework, you know, reconstruct this series, what you should do is take this one back to a Q and this one to a Q with a loose uh, pre-initial, like so capital C point Q, or it could be actually, uh, uh, no, it would, it would have to be capital C dot Q. So a, a loose pre, uh, or yeah, loose pre-initial before uh, uvular. So why don't they do that? Well, this is what I just said. They would normally do that, yeah. Um, do I have another slide? No. Uh, yes, I do. Okay, so it appears that they prefer not to take this uh, back to a uvular because they don't like two shaishan theory to represent the same syllable type. And by syllable type, again, I mean a particular rhyme with a particular place of, uh, of articulation, you know, regardless of the manner of articulation. Okay. So uh, this one that we're talking about, they, uh, they, they see as representing global stop ui, yeah? Uh, whereas this one, they see as representing q, uh, so oi, yeah? And if you look at that Shaishan series, we have a, a h and a ya. So in this one, so this series really, really screams out, I have to be a, uh, a uvular. And uh, and this one that we were looking at, well, kind of also screams out, I have to be a uvular, <laughs> but, but you don't have the ya, for instance, uh, you don't have a, uh, so it, it's not screaming quite as loud that it, <laughs> that it wants to be reconstructed as uvular. So uh, one solution would be to just reconstruct them both as uvulars, but then you would have them both representing the same syllable type, which would be this Q, U, J, yeah? So I think that's their thinking here is they, they, they don't want this one to be Q, U, J. So they have to make it something else. So they make it long stop U, J. Now, again, they're not quite uh, the, the hypothesis that each Shishun series represents a different syllable type is not something that they come out, you know, right up front within their book. Uh, and they never invoke it as a specific principle. Instead, they say, oh, you know, this is how we reconstruct the Shaishan series. So it's a little bit exegetical. But I think we can reconstruct, well, we can, yeah, we, maybe I shouldn't say reconstruct, but reconstitute their thinking in the way I just presented. Okay, so, and that's it for the K prefixes. So again, very few examples of K prefixes uh, on the basis of Shaishan series, right? We saw a whole bunch of K prefixes that they reconstructed on the basis of loan words for, right? Okay. So uh, now on to the T pre initials. So we have uh, here a K uh, initial and here a, a T, so a, a reference to a C initial. And this is how they reconstruct it. Now, you, you could uh, say, well, why don't they just do the opposite? Right. Why don't they take this one back to a TR uh, and then this one to a KT, for instance? That would work. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think there are two reasons why they want to do it this way. 
uh, one is that this is the basic one and uh, this is the derived one, right? So if this one had a K in it, you kind of somehow want the K to be in this one, right? Uh, so I think that's one issue is, is who's being used as a phonetic for, for, for who here, right? So the, if the mother has a K, then you maybe want the K in the daughter. Now, now that's not like a rule that they use absolutely. There's all kinds of circumstances where there's extra stuff uh, in the mother character that doesn't carry over into the daughter, like a medial R or the tone for that matter. But I think this is a slightly different case because it is the, the question is what is the place of articulation of the whole series? And there, you know, you have basically uh, the choice between the velar and the dental, and maybe we defer to the mother character in this case. Yeah. I mean, it's a very small Shijin series, so it's quite hard to know. Yeah. So I don't understand the between the T and the K, there is a dot. You mean like either or it's like no 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 that you can uh you can understand that as meaning a schwa. I think yeah. I always get a little myself confused with the dot uh, because they do write the schwa sometimes. So I so now I think the dot actually means there's no schwa there, but but why don't they not why don't they just write TKR? because they always like to tell you what they think the morphological status of the prefix is. And so they would use like a hyphen if they thought it was uh, some kind of morphological prefix. Uh, and then they use the dot if they don't know. That's so, so if that's, that's what they're, you know, I, I find all these conventions and there's a little bit of cumbersome. So, um, so maybe I would just write TKR and not worry about it. Um, but uh, for instance, uh, you know, a lot of these S prefixes are causes, so they would write that with an S hyphen. Yeah. Um, anyhow, and then the other thing is that this is the number nine, right? And this means elbow, and um, the uh, and gya, the gyarong word for elbow starts with a T prefix. Now. Almost all Kyarong nouns, if you ask me, start with a T prefix. Uh, but the reason for that is actually that it's it, it's it's a slot where Kyarong marks uh, possession, so they need to possess their nouns. Uh, so uh, the T prefix in Kyarong actually is like the the third person. Uh, so uh, the third person possession. So his elbow, I think. I got this right, but I'm not a Yawan specialist. Yeah. So the theory that, that the sort of Sino Tibetanists have, uh, including, I think, especially Cigar here, uh, is that uh, the. I'm going to try this again. No worries. The books are so close, right? Um, so the theory is that, you know, the. That basically, you, you had uh, the possessed form of nouns, and, um, and at least some nouns, like elbow, are probably inalienable, so they always have to be possessed. Uh, and then Chinese leveled this out, uh, and they leveled it out in favor of the, uh, his elbow. So uh, for your purposes, maybe the point is just, we have a story to tell about the T prefix. And it has cognates in other Sanskrit languages. So if your if your choice is between uh, a KT cluster for the first one or a PK cluster for the second one, TK cluster looks better, right? Be both because it explains why one is being used uh, as the phonetic for the other one, and it also uh, explains why uh, why we have this cognate. Um, yeah. Now, some of you who know Sanskrit languages will say. Well, there's also a T prefix in the in the word for nine, yeah. <laughs> uh, and sure enough, like the Tibetan word for nine is gu, yeah. Uh, and I have seen in the past uh, cigar reconstruct the loose pre-initial T uh, in the word for nine, uh, probably thinking along those lines, uh, and it would also make this Shishan series look even better, right? Uh, but they don't do that in their books, so I don't do it here, yeah.
I have a question. Yeah. Um, it, it normally wouldn't occur to me looking at the uh, Kaishu uh, characters that uh, those that those last two characters were part of uh, a Xiexiang series. Um, is, so does that, uh, is, is that what you were talking about when you said you can't, uh, you can't, you can't let yourself be uh, misled by the Kaishu uh, characters because these uh, were these uh, um, were these uh, phonetic series created using the Xiaojiang script? Yeah, so the, I mean, the, so, so I would say 95% of the time you can allow yourself to be uh, misled by Kaishu characters. Uh, and when you can't, I put the pre Qing character on the slide, right? Um, basically, if you only rely on Kaishu characters, you will end up being a splitter. Yeah, you'll have, you'll have more and smaller Shesham series. Whereas if you uh, are willing to let yourself look at older paleographic forms, uh, then you'll turn into something more of a lumper, yeah? Now, as for which variety of the script the Shishan series can work with, well, for, for certain reasons that I will explain in just a moment, that's, I think, not the right way to look at it, right? Because there's, because the, 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 different characters were invented at different times. And each time a character is invented, someone has to think of it as having a phonetic and a, a semantic, right? Like if, if, if someone invented a new character today, which they're perfectly entitled to do, right? People do it uh, in Taiwan just to give their kids hard to spell names, yeah? Uh, then you have to be able to analyze what's the semantic and what's the phonetic of that character, right? And then the person coining a new character will base it on the phonology of their time and place, yeah? So we expect, uh, you know, the oldest characters to have been, to, 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 to be encoding Shishan relationships that were clear during the Shang dynasty, right? And then as more and more characters were invented, uh, they would be invented as appropriate for whatever phonology was happening at that time, yeah? Uh, and we do see, uh, for instance, I, I wish I had some examples to hand, I don't, where uh, a character is given more and more phonetics because uh, the old phonetics have stopped making sense to the speakers, right? So uh, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, so actually I have a follow-up question to this slide as well. So what's like the relationship between the character for nine and the character for like thumb? I, or at least now it means thumb or, or like this twin. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because I would suppose it's also being part of this session series or, or no? Because I'm kind of confused right now. Oh, um, do you know what I mean? No, will you draw it? No, no, well, <laughs> the the kind of the right part of the um, the jaw. Yeah. What we would pronounce jaw in modern Chinese. Yeah. The kind of elbow. Oh, this soon. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Is it also part of the session series? Because. Oh, that's a good question. Because it also like exists as a. Company. Yeah, I think it's I think it's part of this training series. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, this is a case where, like, uh, you know, there's going to be a daughter Shaishan series coming from this one, uh, but uh, and 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 it's only when you look at the orthographic, uh, you know. Let's let me put it this way. I think the structure of our of our uh, sort of network will go like this. Right. Which is because because this link has become obscure. I think yeah, and the one on the dot on the left being being nine. Being nine, okay. Yeah, so nine, you know, elbow. Ah, oh, all right. Okay, like this. Something like that, right? Okay, I see. <laughs> 
I still don't really get whether you can actually put in a uh, T in line. So if you have TK, what do you call out this? Okay, so you can, in order to get to, so, so, so in nine, uh, I could have with a schwa, right? Oh, I, so I, I think I don't have a K, that R has. Yeah, I think you can do this, right? You could do this because you can always like because because the only yeah let's say these loose prefixes you know oops I could do law so these loose prefixes what effect do they have on the development of the um, of the syllable generally speaking none. Uh, in certain cases, and, and you have to be on your toes to, to look at them. Like I think, I think we saw that "sula" developed into something. I don't remember quite. But uh, in general, these are just dropped, and they don't leave any trace at all. Except they would leave. Uh, I think they would leave. Uh, they would get spiritization in um, Vietnamese. Yeah, and uh, maybe that's why they don't do it there. You know. Uh, but from the perspective of you know, uh, from the perspective of um, it's sort of sort of the journey from Old Chinese to Middle Chinese, uh, these these loose prefixes uh, don't have any effect. So now uh, you say okay, then and I think this is a question. Let's just stick with ku as let's imagine we have a root ku uh, in in old Chinese, and then we have different morphological suffixes, like we have a, a, a volantive M and a causative S, and you know a uh, an, an instrumental S or something. Can we do this? You know, and then maybe some. I think there's a circumstantial noun T or something, right? Could you do this? Right. Uh, the the answer is Baxter and Cigar never do this, but that there's nothing in their presentation that would forbid it, as far as I can tell. And uh, actually, uh, Yun Fan Lai, I'm not sure I'll be able to get this right, has pointed out in a very, very recent article that their, uh, that, that their actual reconstructions are either this or this. So here I can do a schwa. And then he has a story to tell about uh, accentuation and apostrophe and things like that. Um, but I think that's, you know, let's say uh, that uh, kind of thing, that kind of uh, uh, observation that he's made, that they only have these two syllable structures that they reconstruct. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and the fact that maybe he can tell a story about it. I think shows that believing Baxter and Cigar can be a useful thing to do, right? Like you just uh, defer to their intuition, and then um, and then you uh, and then you see what that gets gets you, right? Um, even though they themselves never point this out, uh, and as far as I can tell, they would let you have as many draws as you want. Uh, okay, so is that enough with nine? And, and quick, really yeah. Quick. So it's the distinction between tight and loose that the tight premature is low static and the loose premature is high static? Uh, yes. So this is, let's say we add it just like this. This is a tight pre initial, this is a loose pre initial. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I should have said actually, you know, they do allow this too. But I, I think this is, uh, I think they can have like S E something like that. And uh, only loose pre initials by the way, the yellow pre initials. Why would type pre initials start? Yeah, I don't think type pre, I think it's loose loose ones, that, but we would, I, I, I think it's only loose, but I would have to check because th there, there are two reasons they 
recon like there are two kinds of things they look at. One is uh, what are called um, what do they call the the min stocks uh, soften. Yeah, uh, proto min has softened initials, uh, and they also use that for um, for reconstructing uh, these uh, loose um, things. Uh, and I'm not quite sure. I need to check exactly the difference in how they use uh, proto min and how they use Vietnamese. Uh, and I'm having discussed proto min at all in this, in this course because it looks like maybe the reconstruction of proto min that they were using is wrong on this point. So I think that's actually, um, you know, a, a serious sort of caveat lector, right? Is that um, they, that, that if they're reconstructing uh, uh, loose pre initials because of the proto min softened initials, it's possible that. Uh, that they're just relying on outdated proto min reconstructions. Uh, proto min is moving fast right at the moment. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm embarrassed to say, <laughs> as you can tell, there's a few too many details for for me to keep in my head here. Uh, <laughs> that's one nice thing about teaching a course like this is that I have to go and uh, you know check it all. Um, but the nice thing is there are books there. So you can always uh, check these things. And then also they have a spreadsheet of all their reconstructions. Um, but, I, but it's often quite difficult to, yeah, like what, what, what you would really want, right? Is what you would really want is to have like, I don't know, let's say it's, uh, you know, we have something like this in middle Chinese. Uh, and then, I don't know, with this major Chinese character. Now you check the Sheshong series and you know enough to say, okay, either this goes back to TH or it goes back to Shra or it goes back to Fla um, or it goes back to Na, I think, yeah. So then you, you ask yourself which of these it is. And then you ask yourself, is there some kind of, some, some, some sort of, you know, maybe it goes back to, you know, or something, you know, or, or to the, yeah. So uh, it, you need certain pieces of information, right? You need like one or two links in the Shishun series. You potentially need Vietnamese. You potentially need a Prada Icognate. And it would be nice if there was a sort of dictionary, if you like, that just gave you the minimum amount of information you need in each case to reconstruct the old Chinese. No such resource exists. Uh, I have a student who actually who said, that he thinks that Backstrom Scar's book would be more useful if it were just that, if it were just rather than being organized by telling you about um, the syllable of old Chinese, like, oh, this is why we reconstruct uh, pre initials, this is why we reconstruct final R. He thought it, it should just be a list and, you know, giving the reader the information needed for the reader to be able to do these reconstructions themselves. So, absent that, your choices are to. Uh, use someone else's reconstruction, blindly trust their reconstructions, or uh, try to figure out, try to kind of retrace their steps, right? And personally, uh, I use uh, Axel Schiffler's reconstructions as a kind of uh, point of departure, and then try and ask myself, like, well, what, what, what are the disagreements between Axel Schiffler and Baxter, Baxter and Cigar, and can I come up with my own uh, Baxter and Stigar style reconstructions, but it's very hard to know that you have, you know, gotten to where they would have gone unless you just check their spreadsheet and then you don't know how they got there. Yeah. Um, but I guess what I was saying earlier was, is someone like Yunfan uh, just trust them and then notice the certain patterns in their reconstructions. So I do think that uh, trusting them may be a profitable strategy. Uh, even if it's sort of makes you feel uncomfortable. Uh, okay, so we were on T uh, prefixes. And, uh, and here's one. So we have a, a G, and then here's a Ch, and uh, Chs come from Tus, right? So, uh, so they reconstruct the T pre initial in this place. And then um, 
here we uh, have it going to retroflexes that is a little okay so uh what we have here this is again it's a nice this is the better one because we have three characters so it's a slightly slightly longer series, right so we have a k and a k so we really know we're in a k land here right and yes k's can go back to uvulars but there's nothing pointing us to uvulars so it really seems like uh the the syllable being recorded here is kung uh but yet yeah, here's something with a with a t in it so we add a t uh premature yeah okay and so that was it for the t's so we did the the p's the k's and the t's uh and now come the stop pre-initials before resonance and i was kind of on the fence about whether to include this slide because in a sense this isn't these aren't sheshang relationships but in a sense, they are. So I decided to include them because the, this character has two readings. Yeah? One is uh, Pim and one is Lin. And this character has two readings. One is Chip and one is Nap. This character has two readings. One is Quet and one is Nye. Yeah? So what they propose is that uh, these are cases where one reading is from one dialect, one reading is from another dialect, so there's, we have to reconstruct something that then has two different dialect um, reflexes, and that uh, is a nasal in some cases, or or no, I should say resonant in some cases, and a stop in some cases. So what they reconstruct is a stop before a resonant. Yeah. Um, and then why do I see this as a Sheshan connection? Well, because it's a Shechong connection in the sense that, you know, this character with this reading is connected with this character with this reading, right? So same character, but it's still still sort of Shechong connection in the, in the sense that they have the same phonetic, these two readings, right? Okay, I actually am getting a phone call from a friend of mine again and again. So I'm just going to text him saying that I'm in class. And while you're texting, are there um, characters with two different pronunciations that also show that two pronunciations are similar? Or are all these spaces, you know, a bit of a mess? Oh, no, there's lots of cases where, um, you know, let's say this, yeah, we might have the same character and the two readings are uh, just tone differences or something like that. I would say 90% of um, characters with two readings, the, they, the two readings are really similar. Yeah. Um, I'll give you another one that we use a lot in, in old Chinese reconstruction, which is you get um, like, you, you know, the, the character difficult, nan, nan, yeah. I, I'm not gonna write it because, because I'll mess it up even though I do. More or less, no, it's uh, but it, so it has two readings, none and none. Okay, so this we also think is a dialect uh, issue, uh, but um, but I won't go into it right now. Uh, but but in, in, in any case, you see, this is also still pretty close, right? Um, and even here, right? They like they both end in D, right? Like they both end in N and have the same nuclear vowel, like um. You don't expect a character to have wildly different readings, uh, although that is hypothesized to happen in the very earliest Chinese by um, by uh, Bowles. And I'll just give you one example, uh, which is that uh, this character has uh, two modern descendants one is this one and the other one is she what so um so so these are totally unrelated words yeah this one means moon and this one means evening and in the earliest chinese this character could write both morphemes and um that is a thing that happens yeah <laughs> uh, but 
how can I say, this kind of, of phenomenon can only happen as long as the character is iconic, right? Because if someone sees this and says, oh, that's a picture of the moon, then they can say, maybe it's for the morphine moon, or maybe it's for the morphine night, you know? But as soon as it becomes conventionalized, so no longer iconic, then, it, then it's a logogram, right? So, um, so you only get this kind of thing where you have fundamentally totally unrelated readings of characters uh, it, it, when, when it's still iconic. Uh, this for me seems to be the typical relationship between metonymy and metaphor, right? So the, the way that they, ver they diverge, so one will be a part of the whole, like the whole idea of the, and the other like the metaphor, right? So the moon standing for uh, the night, I don't know. Yeah, actually that sounds pretty good because uh, an another one is, um, is uh, this character, which um, has, uh, this is all according to um, Bowles, uh, has, and I don't know what it looked like in, in, in order of descriptions. I'll say it looked like this. Um. <laughs> Usually, I mean, in like Chinese textbooks, yeah. it's like a kneeling moment. Oh yeah, you're right. It's a kneeling moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, but this uh, had two readings: na and an. Uh, so so peace is peace. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so again, uh, th this th we you know this is where we. We're not going to try and say, oh, the, the original word for woman was Anna or something, you know? <laughs> no. <laughs> we just say there's two unrelated morphemes that in Shang Dynasty Chinese, they wrote uh, with uh, this woman character, one that means woman and one that means peace. Uh, but yeah. then peace would be the metaphor because women are like <laughs> it's full. It's full. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Maybe that like like th 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 this uh, these kind of multiple readings of um, of of simple iconic characters would have happened kind of in the first five minutes of the script developing, right? Yeah, because it's it's because as soon as it becomes iconic, you can't do this anymore. Yeah. Now, one thing that's nice in Sumerian has examples like this, yeah, which is basically how do you get how do you get readings for things you don't have characters for yet? You have to use uh, the Rebus principle, or you can use a principle like this. For those who you know who it means something, uh, this guy Shushan said there were six types of Chinese characters, uh, and one of them that he analyzes is called Hui Yi. And um, uh, the Hui Yi characters are supposed to have two semantics. So, for instance, um, what is it that, uh, that uh, woman plus child? Is it that, no? That's not. Right. Yeah. But I but I wrote it wrong. But still, like it, it looks good. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Look, okay. Okay. <laughs> So woman and child, uh, this is pronounced how in um, in modern Chinese. I mean, good, right? And then if if you study Chinese, they will always say uh, like you know Ch Chinese script it captures the the meaning of the words, and that's because you know when a woman is with a child, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, you could also have a picture of me and a cheesecake or something. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, Bolt says, no, any case like this, always one of them is semantic and one of them is kinetic. Yeah. Uh, and so he's the, and, and, and I'll say, allowing himself to give um, one iconic character two readings that are unrelated is one of the ways he he gets himself extra phonetics in order to explain the Hui Yi characters. Yeah. Um, and, and this is quite controversial. Let's say like not everyone agrees with Bill Bolt, uh, but I think he's right <laughs> in any case. I think it's a very profitable line of research. Yeah. 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 Ye
I think that that leads to the picture says something you can have a character like Linda, Brad, when you make up characters and you know if the man needs a bread and things. Yeah, there's, I mean, and I actually uh, saw on uh, the, le the evening lecture I gave um, two years ago, I talked about uh, this, this cuneiform example of, of mouth, where the, where the word for mouth is like, is like uh, the character for head with like basically an arrow pointing at his mouth, yeah, <laughs> and, and the, let's say one tradition says, oh, you know, this is a character with two semantics. One is the head semantic and one is the arrow semantic, right? And then I think what Boltz would say, what I would say is no, it's a picture of an arrow pointing at a guy's mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and the moment that it becomes analyzable as, as, you know, having a phonetic and a semantic component, then it's not iconic anymore. Right, so so don't go around trying to make things uh, have components when they're still iconic. Right, I think that's one lesson of bolts. Okay, so now we go to the nasals before uvulars, and I will just mention that you cannot tell. I think I captured this here. Which nasal it is, right? So they and they they one component of their system is morphological speculation, which I'm not covering in this, in this class. Uh, but so they think, for instance, that a ma pre-initial could be a, a volitional marker. So you can change, you know, something like, um, uh, I don't know, for instance, to sleep. You can take a non-volitional verb to sleep. And then if you say mm, sleep, it means like to pretend to sleep or to try to go to sleep or something like that. So they think that ma is a volitional marker. And then they think mm, this, 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 it's the capital here doesn't mean uvular, it's a full capital. It means of uh, underspecified uh, place of articulation. Uh, they think that is, for instance, an anti passive. Yeah. So will I be able to make up an anti passive on the spot? <laughs> That's, uh, no, I won't. <laughs> I, I will fall into some of the trap if I can't do that. Um, but uh, anyhow, you can't tell it based on Shisham series before uvulars. Uh, so, and you also can't tell based on Shisham series not before uvulars, not before uvulars. These both prefixes literally for voicing. Yeah. So, so you would see, you know, in, in, in a normal Shisham series, by which I mean the non uvular Shisham series, you just see like PH, E, B. Yeah. And it could be that this B goes back to NB. MP rather, but that's not something you're going to see in a Shaytran series because in the Shaytran series you're allowed to mix afterwards. So you always have to get, for instance, Hmong Yen uh, or something like that, right? You can't see it with the Shaytran series, but you can see it with uvular Shaytran series uh, because we have, uh, like here, we have this uh, this velar nasal, and then it's in a uh, it's in a uvular series, right? It's a clear uvular series because you've got uh, a glob stop here and a ya here and a velar here. So what are we going to do with this velar nasal? Well, we take it back to some nasal prefix and, and then we have all these options, right? Because we can't tell what the voicing of the initial was uh, and we can't tell whether the pre-initial was an M or a not. Sorry, an M or a, or a Homo organic name. Q, Q is on the air or just waiting again. Q is here. Oh, uh, this is a nasal Q. I don't know. I have to check. Probably I did this on purpose. Uh, okay. And then, uh, in another sort of, well, is it a Shishun series thing? Is it not a Shishun series thing? We have two readings of this character, one with a, a Y and one with an L. So L you would take back to R and, and Y we would take back to L. So then we have an L-R connection in, in our sort of first pass of all Chinese. So how do we get those to have the same initial? Uh, they say, well, it's maybe a, a, a nasal prefix so that, so that um, the, the way you think of it is that the, the nasal prefix 
protected the rub until after uh no sorry never mind uh but 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 i mean something like what i was about to say <laughs> uh r becomes l so it's more like it it's it, it's it's a it's a lenition circumstance right that sort of yeah, la becomes ya in five B syllables and ra also becomes ya in five B syllables. Yeah, that, that the, the pre initial gives a sort of lenining circumstance that leads to that R uh, merging with the, the L's. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, also uh, dialect variation, same with AT. Okay, so. Uh, now, one place we can see the M of pre initial is before an N because it messes up an N shape in the series, right? So, here this, uh, or it's a na, yeah. So, uh, so na goes back to na, and nya goes back to na here. Nya could also go back to na. Uh, and then, what are we going to do about this M? Well, it should go back to an M, but then, uh, how do we explain this contact between the velar nasal and the labial nasal? Well, maybe it's a uh, an M prefix. I'll just tell you, just to give you a sense of how other people deal with the same stuff, uh, what um, Chris Beckwith does in this series is he says that, uh, that they all had ma and that uh, ma sort of fronted uh, because of the front vowel, yeah, and then he points out that this happened in, in Tibetan. You have things where where mia changes into into nya. Yeah. So that is uh, his idea. But the trouble with Chris Beckwith's idea is he kind of throws out an idea like there. Uh, sorry, throws an idea out there like that, but then doesn't say how that would affect the whole rest of the system, right? Because because if 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 we propose that uh, you know, M before front vowels changes into nya, then we should re-examine all the other nyas and, and so on and so on, right? And that's kind of the thing with uh, old Chinese is you change any piece and then you have to sort of check uh, how it affects everything. Uh, so uh, although I think his idea is perfectly reasonable, I, I can't use it unless, you know, I try and reconstruct old Chinese as I imagine perspective would do it. So I'm gonna, personally, I'm gonna stick by this idea instead. Right? Uh, and then uh, we also can see the same thing before uh, dental nasal. So this is before velar nasal, this is before dental nasal, same story. So nya goes back to na, and then na goes back to na, and then nya goes back to ma, but then the ma should be connected with this na, so we we can start not okay um, right <clears throat> and then uh, I've already touched this before but this is the moment where I officially present it how do we do with velars that are coming up in uvular series so here's an example we have a glottal stop, we have a ya, so we know we're in a uvular series. And what do we do with this velar? Well, we stick a capital C in front and say, mm, we don't know what it is, but some there's some you know uh, conditioning environment for the uh, for the fronting of the uvular to a velar. Uh, and then here is uh, sort of typing syllables. So um, in this case, it's a, a K and a glossa. And then just you know, remind yourself, uh, we could have done it by putting a K prefix in front of a glossa, which is what they did in another case. Right? Okay, and then uh, here it is before the, uh, before the aspirate uvular. Uh, and then here in type B syllables. And why am I giving another one? 
Oh, because of the lift round. I, I've generally not been paying much attention to that, but um, <clears throat> could use it the same thing whether or not it's round. Okay, and that's it for these, you know, using Chasham series to reconstruct uh, pre initials. Yeah. So, regarding the six types of Chinese characters, so you think that only like what, like maybe two really types then? Yeah, well, so, so yeah, so uh, just to, to let everyone know, there's this guy, Shushan, who says there are six types of Chinese characters. Well, one of them, no one knows what he was trying to say. Um, like the fifth or the sixth. Uh, the, the Hui Yi is the, the one that gets talked about, it, or I mean, and so this is based on memory, but he says, let's just see if we can get all the types. I remember that's the song when, uh, like, often, like, uh, actually, the example you gave us from the La Hao are like, yeah, that, that's one where we don't know what he's yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay, so, uh, one is, uh, like, uh, mountain, right? So, um, so that, you know, is just this, right? So that one we can call kind of simple iconic, yeah? Uh, and then we have the, uh, the, the, you know, 90% of the characters, uh, I'll just uh, stick with mountain, I don't even know if this character is city, but, uh, you know, where now this would be, you know, a, uh, a morphine that has to do with water that's pronounced like mountain, right? So this is our Shesheng, uh, or they actually say Xingsheng for in this context, but I'll just say the Shesheng. So we have our Shesheng. I won't get these in the right order, but we have the Hui Yi, which are like this one, which we think don't exist. One of them is, oh, he, he I should have actually, but I'll renumber them now. Sorry. I'll say this is two, three, four, five, six. Uh, another one is, is sort of non iconic, but iconic. I don't remember how people talk about it. Like but I it's Shang, right? I yeah, maybe you could call that. So, Shang means below. So, yeah, that's this is Sha. Yeah, I mean Sha. <laughs> <laughs> Shang means above. Yeah. And, and I think in, I think in, uh, you know, in Oracle, in the bones, it was like just a dot above the line or something like that. So, you know, it's not representing any thing. It's not a picture of a mountain, but it's a sort of uh, representation of an idea, you know? So that's one of them. This is another one. Uh, this is the main one. We think this one doesn't exist. And then one is the, well, just called the Lao Cow one. Uh, and, and we don't know what he was trying to say there. Uh, and I don't remember what the other one is. I think we also don't know what he was trying to say. That I would say, I don't know, let's say, I, you know, why am I wasting my time talking about this? I think like the fact that a second century lexicographer uh, came up with a division of characters into six types. Uh, oh, I remember what the fifth one is. Um, I also just remember, I think it's like, like kind of followed it's, it's, in this opinion. Like, for example, you also gave this example, like good. The one from like all the gravel used to mean song, I guess, but then they like kind of made yeah, a new character. So, so this one is called Tong Tongja. Yeah. Uh, and Tongja is when you use a character kind of incorrectly, is the easiest way to, 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 to explain. So, like you have Gong and you have Gong, you know, and you are supposed to write like this character and instead you write this character. So that's uh, called Tongja, uh, and it's actually one of my transposers, right? It's one, if, if someone confused two characters, that means they must have had a, a similar pronunciation. But the thing is, Tongja is, is, is like a, like it's, it's not obvious to me that it's a way of creating new characters in the same sense, yeah? Like, like it's a way of confusing existing characters, yeah? Uh, it's not a way of creating new characters. So, so this really feels like I mean to be to, to, to risk you know being what is it you, that you do nowadays cancel uh, to, to 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 risk being canceled. To me, this really feels like Borges with the you know uh, there are six types of animals 
large animals, animals owned by the emperor, bees, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, so. I actually agree. I mean, when I first like learned about this, I also thought that, especially like the, the last two are kind of like vague. Yeah, and 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 just a strange artifice of kind of institutional uh, inertia is like this is also like you know oftentimes like week two of Chinese class they're like in the second century a man decided it's like why are you telling me about this yeah well what's his name again Shushan and I'm I don't want to knock him he's a brilliant guy who did who 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 wrote a book that was in, is incredibly valuable also this I this uh, six um, this uh, analysis of there being six types of characters comes from the, I think, that post phase of his book, and it's not entirely clear that he wrote the post phase. So uh, maybe I can actually say that I think Shushan is a total genius, uh, one of the great minds of history, uh, and someone threw some unfortunate gratification of Chinese characters on the end of his book. Um, but anyhow, uh, I... I I don't know why someone you know tricked me into talking about it. Uh, it's, it's probably you. Yeah. Uh, I'm really like um, interested that you don't believe in just like quote characters because that's what they always tell us, you know. Yeah, and it's well, it, it's a cute way of telling stories, right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, they sometimes do that, but yeah. uh, but I, you know, when I was first learning uh, Chinese characters, which was when I was studying Japanese. I, I just felt like, look, my, I don't want to fill my head with falsehoods, right? <laughs> so, uh, so don't tell me cute stories about these Chinese characters. Um, but I mean, Boltz has a, a book. It's now it's now dated. He would like to come out with a new edition, uh, like it uses Wade Giles, I think, uh, but uh, a book from like '98 or something, where he really presents the. There are no Wade. You, Characters and he also has some follow-up articles there in the same vein, including a very nice article on Huayi is in the Brill Encyclopedia of Chinese Language and Linguistics, which in general is a good resource. Uh, you know, it unfortunately costs a million dollars or something like that, um, but maybe your institution subscribes to it. Um, 